speech, and night to night reveals his knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the ends, end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heart. Let's pray. Father, again, we just thank you for your amazing grace, your grace that not only saves us but keeps us. We thank you for our pastor and just for the, the time you give him to sp study your word, but we thank you that he delights in your word because he delights in you. Help us to be examples for you. Help us to let your spirit control us. Amen. I just encourage you, if you're coming to the conference, please get signed up. We've got more people signing up than normal, and we only have so much room. So don't get to the end and say, sorry, no more room in the inn. So if you get signed up, you're in. You know, that way, uh, we, and we need to have a count of, you know, how many people to expect. So, and... Have a, um, did we have like a limit, like we can stop? Yeah, I well, I think, I think we're going to, yeah, I know, we haven't had that problem before, but yes, we, we can only fit so many people in that room, so I don't, I don't want them to have to stand, you know, so we'll, uh, <clears throat> So yes, if you're coming, and I hear a lot of people you are that haven't signed up yet, please get signed up so we, we have that count. How about Thursday? Pardon me? How about Thursday? Yes, and if you're coming to dinner on Thursday, we need to know that so we can uh, make sure the restaurant has food enough for everybody. All right, let's get started. Good morning, Brian. Now... I said last week that my plan was to start 2 Thessalonians today, but that got changed, okay? I, midweek, I couldn't get Psalm 19 out of my head, and so I started digging into it, and the next thing I knew, we're going down a different road. So it came to be part two. So we were going to start 2 Thessalonians next week. That's the plan, okay? <laughs> now, I know that last week's message was a shock to many of you, as it was a shock to me. I remember where I was. I was standing right there when I first heard it. And one of the men in this church, said, I don't even remember the conversation, but they said something about flat earth. And I looked at him like, are you on drugs? Flat earth, what the heck? And I, I was shocked. And I went and did some research, and I'm like, hmm, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> So that was, eight, that was eight years ago, okay? And I did not come at flat earth from a biblical perspective. I came at it from different ev evidence that I was seeing. But then as I started just recently really digging into Scripture, I'm like, well, this is, seems to be what the Scriptures teach. Now, I don't know why, but this stirs up people's emotions more than anything I've seen. More than Calvinism, more than preterism, you talk about flat earth, people go bananas, you know? It's like, we love our globe. Don't you mess with our globe, okay? And I want you to know that my perspective here, I don't have a dog in this fight. You know, I don't have any stock in globe whatever, okay? So I'm just coming at it from what I see as a biblical perspective, all right, And that's why I gave you a warning last week, you know, because I know that this is an emotional subject. But I was surprised that the response I received was overall positive. I mean, by far, okay? Matter of fact, as of Thursday, just on YouTube, 80% of the comments were positive. That's pretty amazing. Um, and I was, a, I was kind of surprised because there was no thumbs down. But then I found out, some guy asked in the comments, how come there's no thumbs down on any of these videos? And then someone else commented, YouTube, remove that. So you can't. So here I was all excited. No one gave me a thumbs down. <laughs> and they can't. <laughs> you can, The thumb up, you can do. You can't do thumb down. It's on there, you just can't click it. All right. 
Now, the thing that surprised me about the reaction from last week is that people who wanted to argue, and I mean, you know, just argue in the sense of debate, they didn't want to argue from a textual, exegetical perspective. They wanted to argue from cosmology. I don't care about that, okay? That's not my argument. My argument is, this is what I see the Bible teaching, okay? This is a lie, according to Scripture. And when I see people fighting from this perspective, it makes me think that you hold the pseudoscience above the Scriptures. I pleaded with you at the very beginning of the message to be a Berean, to search it out for yourselves, and see if what I had to say is true. But to me, a Berean would go to the Scriptures to support their position, not to pseudoscience, okay? This is what disappointed me. I got zero pushback from the Scriptures, from people using the Scriptures. Zero biblical arguments, okay? So I guess that just makes me think that Pseudoscience to many people trumps scripture. Well, I know the Bible says that, but you know, hey, to me, the Bible is the living word of God, and I'm sticking to it. Okay, I'll take the Bible over anything. Okay, so let me try to say this nicely. You can stop writing me, stop texting me, and stop calling me unless you have a biblical argument. Okay? Because I don't care about cosmology. That's all nonsense. There's no proof to any of that. So I don't want to hear about it. All right? But if you have something scripturally, I'm wide open. I want to hear that. Because that's what's important to me. Now, last week someone sent me a link to an article from Biologos entitled, listen to this title, The Firmament of Genesis 1 is Solid. But that's not the point. <laughs> This is written by Pete Enns, who is Abram C. Clemens, professor of biblical studies at Eastern University. He's a former senior fellow of biblical studies for Biologos. And in the very first sentence, he says, to insist that the description of the sky in Genesis 1 must conform to contemporary science is a theological problem. Now, I think it's more of a problem of not understanding what science is. Okay, because science has nothing to do with cosmology. There's no test they can do. There's nothing they figured out. Hey, look, this, they, we, we've gone over this, and this is true. No, it's just, now ah, this looks interesting. Let's say it's this. Modern cosmology, as I said last week, is all imagination. And if that bothers you, I'm sorry, but that's the truth. But yes, I think you can have a theological problem if you think Genesis 1 or any part of the Bible must conform to contemporary pseudoscience. I mean, if you look at anything and say, well, science says this in the Bible, and you go with science, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that. How, much of, how many people, how many scientists will you find that say man can walk on water? Do you believe a man did? Okay, so where does science go? The article goes on to say, Genesis 1 and 2 tell the story of creation. And it says things that are at odds with what modern people know to be true of the world and the universe around us. What's wrong with that sentence? Right. Genesis 1 and 2 are at odds with what modern people know to be true. Oh, so the Bible's at odds with truth. Well, you know, John 17, 17 says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. All right, my basic, my most basic presupposition is that the Bible is the word of God. That's my starting point. The Bible is inspired, it's inerrant, it's infallible. It's God's com complete message for humankind. Believers, scientific views should never play a part in our actual interpretation of Scripture. Interpretation must be based solely on the text and the context it is in. If the Bible is the Word of God, then no other authority, 
including scientific reasoning, should dictate how it's to be understood. The article goes on to say, arguing for a non-solid rakia in Genesis is extremely prob problematic. It is. That's so true, all right? For two reasons. First, the biblical and extra-biblical data indicate that rakia means a solid structure of some sort. The second problem is much larger theological issue, but is actually more foundational. Regardless of what one thinks of the rakia, why would anyone assume that the ancient cosmology in Genesis should be expected to be in harmony with modern science in the first place. Again, there is no science when it comes to cosmology. So how could they be in conflict? The article goes on. Virtually every description of Rakia, from antiquity to the Renaissance, depicts it as solid. Guess why? That's because it is, okay? The non-solid interpretation of Rakia is a novelty. Other Old Testament passages are consistent with the Rakia being solid. And he lists some text there. The noun Rakia is derived from the verb, it's Raka, he doesn't say that, but it's Raka, that means to beat out or stamp out as in hammering metal into plates. This suggests that the noun form is likewise related to something solid. So they agree that the Bible teaches a solid dome over the earth. No, they, they're just saying that's what it says, okay? Article goes on, the solid nature of the Raki is well established. It is not the result of anti-Christian conspiracy to find errors in the Bible, but the solid, I like that, the solid result of scholars doing their job. Yes. Yes, this does not mean there can be no discussion or debate. I agree, we can debate. But to introduce a novel interpretation of Rakia would require new evidence, or at least a reconsideration of the evidence we have that would be compelling to those who do not have a vested religious interest in maintaining one view or the other. I agree, and we can talk about it. We need to talk about it if you think there's a different interpretation of Rakia. But like I said, the scholars are all in favor. Most of them are in favor of this idea that it's just a solid dome. This is what I was talking about. They'd agree with that. <clears throat> and if you want to refute the flat earth, to me, do it from the scriptures, not from pseudoscience. Tell me what the Bible says, how you see the Bible pointing in a different direction. Because like I said, that's all I really care about. So let's go back to Genesis and look at it, some, a text we looked at last week, but look at it from a, maybe a little different angle. Genesis 1, 14 through 17. And God said, let there be lights in the rakia of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and seasons, for days and years. And let there be lights <coughs> excuse me, in the rakia of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights. Not one reflector and one light, but two lights. The greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. Now we used this text last week to talk about the rakia. Here we see that the sun, moon, and stars are actually located inside the rakia. The stars, I think, are actually embedded in the rakia. Now these lights, he says, are to be for signs and for seasons. Now the word sign here is the Hebrew word ot, meaning the sign or the seal. Now, I think you're probably familiar with this by now. We've talked about this a lot. The letters in the Hebrew alphabet were originally pictures. And every Hebrew letter has some meaning behind it. It's not like our letter, our A, what's A mean? It means A. That's the first letter. That's all it means, okay? But in the Hebrew, this is the word ot in the original Hebrew pictographic language. This is what it would look like. In Hebrew, you read from right to left, okay? So the first letter in ot is aleph. And aleph had, bring the, had the idea, it's an ox head, so it, the idea of strength or power or leader. That's what the Aleph stood for. Then the second symbol is the Vav, and the Vav represents 
a nail, okay? <clears throat> and then um, we have the Tav, and the Tav is usually designated as a cross. So here, listen. So the sun, moon, and stars were first and foremost a sign, and this word, the letters say, the leader nailed to the cross. Now that's either some kind of weird coincidence. Wow. How about that? He says they're for a sign, and if you take the letters and you put the words together, it's talking about the leader nailed to the cross. You can say that's a coincidence. I don't believe in coincidences. So how do the heavenly lights point to the leader nailed to the cross? How do they point to Messiah? Well, two ways. First of all, the word seasons is the Hebrew word moed. And moed means appointed times, referring to the feasts of Yahweh. Now We've gone over the feasts many times here. The feasts point to Messiah, and they're dependent upon the moon. So the sun, moon, and stars are placed where they are for the scriptural determination of the feasts of Yahweh, and all these feasts point to Messiah, who is the leader, nailed to the cross. Secondly, I think there's more to it than just the feasts. I believe that the stars are a sign that point to Messiah. To be more specific, I believe that the constellations of the zodiac are signs that point to Messiah and His death on the cross. Now, we've talked about this before also, but before you get upset, please understand that I'm talking not about astronomy, not about astrology, but astronomy, okay? Astronomy is the study of God's creation in the stars that declare His glory. Astrology means the word about the stars, but in our culture, it's no longer that at all. Astrology is its horoscopes and stuff like that, fortune telling, you know, what is your sign and all that nonsense which is actually forbidden in Scripture, people think the astronomical signs are about them. Somehow, those stars are all about you and the day you're going to have today. Okay? And astrology can say that a man can tell something about himself from the stars. Well, that's just nonsense. The original purpose was to tell something about Yahweh and His plan for the world. Now, the word zodiac... It's not a bad word. It comes from zoad, which means path or way, and it refers to the way the sun passes through the various constellations during the year. So the signs talked about in Genesis 1.14 can be understood when we look at the way the wise men, the magi from the east, who visited the young child Yeshua, they must have been very assured that these sign, of these signs that they read in the heavens, because they were convinced enough that the story of the star they observed in the east to travel a great distance by camel. And these wise men were priests from the country where Daniel and the children of Israel had been led captive, and their culture was schooled in the study of the stars. So Daniel was made chief master over all the wise men and astrologers of Babylon, according to Daniel 2.48 and 5.11. And Daniel would have taught these priests about the promise of coming Messiah to be born of the tribe of Judah out of the house of David. Now, this view that I'm talking about, about the stars proclaiming the gospel, this view is laid out in E.W. Bullinger's book, The Witness of the Stars. It's also laid out in Joseph Seiss's book, The Gospel in the Stars. And they argue in these books that, it, that the signs of the zodiac were originally designed by God to communicate the gospel. You say, how in the world can that happen? Well, we did a message on this when I went into the different constellations and their significance, so you have to go back and find that and look at that because I don't want to go into all that now. But those people living before Babel, when everybody had the same language, I think they understood the language in the stars. I think they were taught it, therefore they understood it. Please understand, this is nothing you can just figure out on your own. Okay, like you look up at the stars and you say, Look at those stars. Wow, that looks like a virgin. That looks like Virgo. Did you ever see anything like that in the sky? In the sky? I haven't. And it's the same thing, though, if you never learned how to read and I took, gave you a book and say, look at this. And you're like, it doesn't mean anything to me. You know, you have to be taught to read. The same thing, you have to be taught to read the stars and what's in there, okay? But the zodiac is a witness to God. Now, as always, I'm not asking you to buy this. But don't reject it without studying it. That's the thing. I want you to look into this for yourself and, 
and see. Uh, it's fascinating to me, and I, I really think there's something to this. Now, astronomer John P. Pratt writes this about the view of the gospel and the stars. He says, Suffice it to say that when I examined the evidence as a Ph.D. in modern astronomy, a student of ancient wisdom and a practicing Christian, I have found more evidence favoring the proposal than against it. I now accept the overall concept, in spite of several reservations. To me, there is enough good evidence to accept the overall theory, even though many of the details, and especially the translation of star names, need a lot of work. Now, the book of Enoch states that an angel revealed the constellations to Enoch. All right? Let's look at this. He says, in Azazel, these, all these crazy names we find in here are names of gods or angels, if you will, whatever, who are coming to Ezekiel and teaching him things. And Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates and made known to them the metals of the earth and the art of working them and bracelets and ornaments and the use of antimony, ant <laughs> antinomy and the beautifying of eyelids and all the costly stones and all the coloring tinctures and there arose much godlessness and they committed fornication. And they were led astray and became corrupt in all their ways. Shimjaza taught enchantments and root cutting. Ermaros, er the resolving of enchantments. Barakajel taught astrology. So here we get, he's talking about these people and they're bringing in this idea of astrology. And we have Kabael, he teaches the constellations. And then Arakiel, no, sorry, Ezekiel, the knowledge of the clouds, then Arakiel, the sign of the earth, Shamzeel, the rising sun, and Shariel, the course of the moon. That's uh, Ezekiel, or Enoch 8.1. So now, what Enoch says is not true. Knowledge of the constellations it has to be special revelation. Again, you just don't look up and get all these pictures that they have put together. But if someone teaches you, then you can see this. Now, let me share with you some texts from Scripture that lead me to believe that the zodiac points to Christ. In Romans 1, we see something interesting. Romans 1, 18 through 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain in them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they're without excuse. Now, how has God made His eternal power and His divine nature clearly seen. How has he showed that? Well, the text says, in the things that have been made. So some point to this verse, and they'd say, this is natural revelation, so men can look around at the things that God made and know there's a God, okay? And then because they know there's a God, then they come to God and they trust God. I don't think that's what the Bible's talking about here at all, okay? Later in Romans, Paul seems to be following through on this, and in Romans 10, we read something very familiar, which is answered by Paul in a way that I think many people don't catch at first. So let's look at Romans 10. This should be very familiar to you. Romans 10, 13 through 17. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him and who they not believe? And how do they believe in him and who they've never heard? And how do they hear without a preacher? And how do they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Now we're familiar with this text. Many of you probably have this memorized. Paul talks to them about the necessity of calling on the name of the Lord. 
But what you got to see here is this is laid out backwards. Because first you have to be sent. And then the sent person has to preach. And then because he's preaching, people hear. And then because they hear, they believe. And since they believe, they can call on the name of the Lord. Okay? That's how, it, that's how it has to start. That's the order. That makes sense. But now notice the next verse. Verse 18. But I ask, have they not all heard? So this is a, an objector here that Paul's, Paul's dealing with. And he asks, haven't they heard? And you might expect Paul to say, no, they haven't heard. That's why we got to send some people. Right? So they can hear. They haven't heard. But the construction here is a double negative. The effect is to rule out entirely the possibility that they didn't hear. And Paul replies, indeed they have. What? Yes, they've heard, Paul says. And then what's really weird here is he quotes Psalm 19 as proof that they've heard the gospel. So Romans 10 is talking about the necessity of believing in Yeshua to be saved. You with me on that part? Okay. Then Paul asks, or the objector asks, have they not heard? And then he says, indeed they have. And his proof that they've heard is Psalm 19. Let's look at it. The first six verses here. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky, that's Rakia, above, proclaims the handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There's no speech. There's no words where the voice is not heard. The voice goes out through all the earth and the words to the ends of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes up like a bridegroom leaving the chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat." Now, the standard view of Psalm 19 is that it tells us about the knowledge of God that has been written for us in two volumes, all right? General revelation, which is the creation, the first six verses, and then from seven down, it starts talking about the law of God, okay? So we have special revelation, the Bible. We have general revelation, the creation. In the first part of this psalm, most commentators See David saying that God reveals Himself through His world, through nature. But is that true? Is that what he's really saying? Let me ask you, what is this psalm about specifically? Is it about nature in general? No, it's not. These verses declare the greatness of God as seen in the heavens, or the rakia, it's not about nature in general. The focus here is the dome. And I'll show you that in a minute, all right? Now, let me ask you something, because I think this is a really confusing thing in theology. Can man come to know God through natural revelation? He sees the beauty of God's creation. He looks up and he sees the stars in the dome, and he, see, can, he can just say, man, God made this, I believe him. Can that happen? Okay. Let me ask you this. Basically, it's just it's, the idea is all men can know God because they, they just look and they see Him. And, that, and that's what people do with Romans 1 here. They take Romans 1 and they say, well, this is talking here about the things that have been made. So people can see the, what God's made and they know they're without excuse and, and therefore they fall down and worship God. And they take, they'll take Romans 1 to be referring to general revelation. Man looks at the creation, he knows there's a God, he knows he's without excuse, Mm, the first part of 21 says, for although they knew God. And here's where a big argument comes. Who's he talking about? Who knew God? And most people will say, well, this refers to everybody. Everybody knew God because of natural revelation. They know God. That's not what Paul's talking about at all. That's, look at what Paul says later in 1 Thessalonians. Gentiles who do not know God. They have natural stuff. They see the world. They see things. They don't, they don't know God. But in Romans 10, Paul asks, have they not heard? And he says, indeed they have. And then he quotes Psalm 19. Now before we look at that, let me say a word about natural revelation. Romans 1 is not talking about natural or general revelation. I believe it's talking about pre babel men who all had a knowledge of God because God taught them. They knew the constellations. They'd been taught by God. At Babylon, God said, I'm done with you. 
that's it, I'm moving on, and he creates Israel, all right? But I think when the language is all one, people understood this. You know, you go to any language now and point to the stars and the constellations, and they all have different names, but they all mean the same thing. And how'd they all come to that? Well, we all started with one language, and when the language divided, they came up with new, but they're still talking about the same thing, all right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Natural or general revelation will not bring anybody to God. Doesn't happen that way. But here's something that may surprise you. Special revelation won't bring anybody to God either. You still agree with me? Because I think we think that. The Bible, if you give them special revelation, they'll come to God. Really? Okay, then here's a plan. <clears throat> Go out and get people. Bring them in here. Kidnap them. Grab them. Tie them up. Bring them in. Set them down, and we'll turn the speakers on proclaiming the Bible until they get saved. It's going to work, right? And then they'll forgive us for kidnapping them, and so everything will be okay. <laughs> no. I wish it worked that way. Believe me. I would sign up right away. To, let's go kidnap. Let's bring them in here. Let's get them saved. Listen, the only way anybody ever comes to God is if God draws them. Period. John 6, 44. This is what I call an ungetoverable verse for Arminianism, okay? It says, no one can come to me, Christ is speaking. Nobody. No, not them, not them. No one. Nobody comes unless, oh, we have an exception here. What's the exception? The Father who sent me draws him. If God draws them, they come. If God doesn't draw them, they don't come. Now, hopefully you all are familiar with the word draws here, right? Helkuo is the Greek word. You should even know that word by now. Helkuo is only used like seven or eight times. And here's what Helkuo means. To draw, to drag by irresistible superiority. Okay? You should have that memorized. You, we've heard that enough. Okay? That's what it means. Oh, so people say, well, God has to woo you. I don't even know what woo means. Okay? I don't know how you woo somebody. <laughs> woo, woo! You know, I, it's just, that's... That's a crazy thing, you know, but I don't get that. But God doesn't woo. God grabs and drags, all right? It's used of Peter drawing his sword. Peter didn't woo his sword out. He grabbed that thing and he pulled it out. It's used of dragging men into court. God, nobody, people, nobody comes to God unless he drags them to himself. And he does that. And listen, men have to be irresistibly drawn because 1 Corinthians 2.14 says the natural person that's the man without the Spirit, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. <laughs> Do you need proof of this? Just go talk to somebody about the gospel, and they're like, that's ridiculous. Why don't they get it? For their, their folly to them, watch, he is not able to understand them. Natural man can't understand the gospel because they're spiritually discerned. So he can't appreciate God's glory through the heavens or through special revelation. God first must change his heart. You must be born again, and that's an act of God that God sovereignly does. He gives men life. Once you're alive, you say, I believe the gospel because I have spiritual life. All right? Dead men do not see the glory of God. Dead men do not believe in God. Dead men don't care about God. All men are lost, Jew and Gentile, none seeking God, but God does seek man, and when he does, they come. By God changing the heart. All right, let's go to Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Now, this is what's called Hebrew parallelism. It's used a lot throughout the Hebrew. It's, it's a form of poetry, all right? And so what he's doing here, the heavens in the first part of the verse are echoed in the sky, which is the dome, in the second part of the verse. And then we have declare here, parallels, proclaims, and then we have glory finds its partner in handiwork. So with nearly a one-to-one -one correspondence, such poetic parallelism has often been called synonymous. They call this synonymous poetry because he's saying the same thing in the first part and in the second part, all right? Now, the pair heavens and sky are not precise synonyms because heavens, the word shamayim, is more generic. It occurs over 400 times in the Tanakh, 
But by contrast, the sky here, which is rakia, occurs only 17 times, and nine of those are in the creation account in Genesis 1. So the writer moves from the more generic assertion, the sky, the heavens, Shemayim, to the very specific display of God's work in the, in the handiwork, in the dome. The dome proclaims His handiwork. Now the word declare here is from the Hebrew word safar. Does that ring a bell? We talked about it last week. Okay, you, you got to know these Hebrew words, people. Write these down. Okay, safar. All right. This is the same word we saw in Genesis 15, 5. And he brought him outside, speaking to Abram, and he said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Okay, so number here. All right. This is the, the both of these words, declare and number, they're both the same Hebrew word, safar. <clears throat> and this is a, so far can mean intensively to recount, that is to celebrate, to show forth, to speak, to tell. It comes from a root meaning, a book or a scroll. Now, in the Septuagint, the word number is arithmeo, and it means to reckon up. And arithmo is a, a much wider than number, and it can mean enumerate or reckon. In other words, what he's saying is you need to read or tell the story that's in the stars. I like the New American Standard Bible here. It translates it this way. The heavens are telling the glory of God. And again, specifically is dealing with the rakia. He specifies that in the second part of the parallel. Now, I really think telling is a good translation. The heavens are telling of the glory of God. So Yahweh told Abraham, recount or tell the stars. There's a story there, Abram. David said the heavens are telling of the glory of God. So there's a story in the stars, and Yahweh wanted Abraham to take note of it, and David says it proclaims God's glory. There was something about this story in the stars that Abram believed, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Genesis 15, 6. He believed in Yahweh, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Now, let me ask you something. What did Abram believe? Was it that I'm going to have a bunch of descendants? God says, Abram, you're going to have a bunch of kids. I believe that. God said, well, you're righteous for believing that. Where would you get that from out of Scripture, okay? How would that make him righteous? Or was it maybe the message about redemption that was in the constellations? See, Paul tells us, that Abraham had the gospel preached to him. Maybe it's in Genesis 15, 5, when God says, look up. Tell the stars. Galatians 3, 8. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying in you, all nations will be blessed. So how did he do this? Was it in the stars? Whatever it was that Abraham believed, it caused him to be counted as righteous. So I think that Yahweh showed Abraham that one of his descendants would redeem man from the curse and satisfy the justice of God. How do I know that? Yeshua told me. He told me. In John 8, 56. He says, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day, and he saw it. He saw it. Abraham believed that God would provide a redeemer to deal with man's sins. Maybe that gospel message was in the stars embedded in the rakia. Back to Psalm 19. All right, so the focus of this psalm is about the heavens. Again, the Hebrew word for sky here is rakia. We studied that word out last week. We saw the stars are in the rakia. I think that what David is referring to here is the zodiac that's in the rakia. So this is the focus, the sky, the dome. Now let's look at verse 3. He says, there is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Look at verse 2. Verse 2 says, day to day pours out speech, night to night reveals knowledge, there is no speech. What? 
Which is it? <laughs> we're pouring out speech, we're revealing knowledge, and then there's no speech. Uh, I'm confused. What, what is this about? Well, the, I think this is hard to believe, but the King James Version actually clears this up. Because it says, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. That's the difference. Now, the Geneva Bible put it this way, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Then it has the note, the heavens are the schoolmaster to all nations, no matter how barbarous, okay? Albert Barnes writes this, the idea conveyed by our common version, KJV, is probably the correct one. This is the idea in the Septuagint and the Latin Vulgate. According to this interpretation, the meaning is, there is no nation, there are no men, whatever may be their language, to whom the heavens do not speak, declaring the greatness of the glory of God. So what is it that utters or pours forth speech, which voice goes out to all the world? Whatever it is, it shows the glory of God. So is the glory of God seen in the existence of stars alone? No, because many would look at those and say that's from the Big Bang. Okay? But look at 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, and shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Yeshua the Christ. It is the work of Christ that shows the glory of God more than anything else. So the glory of God is not just stars, but the work of Christ in redemption that is literally laid out in those stars. If the heavens declare the glory of God, then they're saying something about Christ. There's something in that rakia, which I believe is laid out in the zodiac, which declares Christ. The gospel message is written there. Back to Psalm 19. Now, as you read this language... Does it give you the idea that the sun's in motion? Look at it. Well, let's back up here. The voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them is set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a... This talking about the sun. The sun comes out like a bridegroom. It leaves its chamber like a strong man. It runs its course. It's rising from the end of heavens, and its circuit to the end of them... There's nothing hidden from his heat. So do you get the idea from that psalm that the sun's moving? Well, that's not what modern cosmology teaches us, is it? Does the sun move? Let me tell you what NASA says, in case you care, okay? <clears throat> the sun is 4.5 billion is a 4.5 billion year old dwarf star. How'd they figure that out? They did carbon dating on it. <laughs> How did they figure out the date of a, this? And listen, they say this is a glowing ball of hydrogen and helium. But hydrogen and helium are what? Gases. But these gases are in what? A vacuum. Huh. Scratching my head thinking, I guess they're smarter than me, so okay. They go against the law of gas, they go against the law of entropy, but okay, they, they, they got to be smart, right? And this thing, this ball is at the center of the solar system. Here's the thing. This thing is 93 million miles from the earth. Huh? 93 million miles. They measured it. They got a long, long tape measure. Okay. They figured it out. Here's the funny thing. You ever been out on a day when it's kind of cloudy and you see the sun coming and some of the rays are going this way, some of the rays are coming straight down, some of the rays are going this way? If that sun is 93 million miles away, how is the light refracting in different... It would indicate a local sun that was shooting out. But again, I just, I'm crazy that way, you know. They tell us that the earth revolves around... The sun is stationary and the earth revolves around... Now, it's not totally stationary because it orbits around the center of the Milky Way galaxy, okay, which how they get that, I don't know either. But the whole solar system to them orbits the center of the Milky Way galaxy. We're moving in an average of 450,000 miles an hour, but even at that rate, they say that it's going to take us about 230 million years to make one complete orbit around the Milky Way. 
So I guess none of us are going to see it. We're not going to live long enough to make one orbit, okay? But so we have this stationary sun in our galaxy. It's stationary. Everything's moving around it. But the Bible, on the other hand, now wait a minute. So we can believe them, and most people just do, because the Bible, it must be wrong. Because what does the Bible know? What does God know about creation? Right? Yeah. Do you see how dumb that is? I mean, what would God know about it? You know, science, these scientists know way more about it than God would know. Because it says the sun leaves its chamber. It runs its course. It's rising from the ends of heaven. The circuit is to the end of them. You think he could have said more clearly that the sun's moving? How would he do it? What language would he use to try to tell us that the sun is in motion? All right? It sure appears from this text that the sun is moving. Now, it says their voice goes out through all the earth. Some translations have the word line here. Their line goes out. Voice is from the Hebrew word kav, and kav means a cord, a connection, especially for measuring, figuratively a rule. So this is something for measuring. It's usually translated line. It's used 21 times in the Tanakh, and most of them refer to a measuring line. So there's a measuring line that goes out. Notice what Isaiah 28 says. And the word of Yahweh will be to them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. They may go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. So Kav is used here four times, translated as line. And here in our text in Psalm 19.4, the singular number is put forth to represent the plural. That is, their writings are made up of several lines. So this has given us the picture, a line, a writing, something written out. The heavens don't teach men with an audible voice, but visibly, by exhibiting things to their eyes, which is done in lines or by writing. Voice here is parallel to words, in other words, there's writing in the dome. There's lines of text that tell the glory of God, and these are in the stars. That's what he's trying to say here. Now, earth here is the Hebrew eretz, which Strong defines as from an unused, unused root, probably meaning to be firm. And then he says it just means earth at large. And then we have the word world, and that's the Hebrew word teveil, which Strong defines as the earth as moist and therefore inhabited. So the psalmist basically, he's, he's partnering again in parallels of the earth and the world here. All right? And then he says this, In them he set a tent for the sun. In them is referring to what? The earth and the world. All right? In the earth, in the world, he made a tent for the sun. Now, tent here is ohel, and it means a tent. Write that down. Okay, that's a, that's a, all right, that's exactly, it means a tent, a covering, a dwelling place. Uh, when you think of a tent, you might think of something, you know, like a teepee or something. Their tents weren't like that. Their tents kind of look more like a dome, okay? And so the sun, the psalmist is saying, is in a tent. It's in a dwelling place. This is a reference to the rakia. And that sounds like what Isaiah says in Isaiah 40, 22. He says, it is he who sits above the circle, not sphere, circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. So according to the Bible, we're in a tent-like structure, and so is the sun. The sun is in a tent or a dwelling place. Now that fits with the flat earth view. Because we believe the sun is inside that dome and it's circling around over the earth. But that does not fit a globe view, does it? The sun is not in any kind of tent. It's out there and everything's revolving around it. All right? So why... <clears throat> Listen, is God just trying to mess with our heads? He's trying to confuse us. Let me tell you what the sun... It was really made out of it, but, you know, don't worry about it because the scientists will straighten you out later. No. <clears throat> He says, leaving his chamber, it runs its course. 
That is motion, people. The word course here is or a, and it means a well-trodden road. On the flat earth model, again, the sun goes in circles around the earth, under the dome. It doesn't fit what they tell us about cosmology at all. So I guess we have to make a decision. Are we going to believe them? Because certainly they know more than God. Or are we going to believe what the Scripture says? Are we somehow going to say, well, the Scripture says that, but it really doesn't mean that? Its rising is from the end of heaven, and its circuit to the end of them. Again, this is Hebrew parallelism. And notice that it says the sun is rising. Now that's a problem, right? Is it a problem to flat earth, or is it a problem to the globe? It's a problem to both, isn't it? Isn't it a problem to both? I mean, in the globe model, does the sun rise? No, it doesn't move. So we should get up in the morning and say, what a lovely earth revolving, right? Because the sun doesn't rise, all right? So we know it doesn't fit on the globe, but the weird thing is it really doesn't fit on the flat earth model either because the sun is circling around overhead. It's not rising or setting. It's just going around in a circle. So we got a problem here? Well, not really. All we got to do is dig a little deeper. Like, what do these Hebrew words mean? Well, the word rising here is the Hebrew word matzah. And matzah means going forth. That is the act and egress or the place and exit, hence a source or product. This word is used 25 times in the Tanakh. This is the only place it's translated rising. It's interesting, you know, translators have bias like everybody else. And here what it should be is it's going forth is from the end of heavens, not rising. That's not, that's not at all what this word means, okay? Now someone brought up last week, what about Ezekiel, Ecclesiastes 1.5? It says the sun rises and the sun sets. Some translations say sets, here it says goes down. And hastens to the place where it rises. See, the Bible says the sun rises and sun sets, but you say it doesn't. Well, again, the word here is zara, which means irradiate, shoot forth beams. That is to rise specifically to appear. So what this verse is literally saying is the sun appears. Now that fits, right? Goes down here is the Hebrew word bow, and it means to go or come in a wide variety of applications. So what this verse is really saying, the sun appears and disappears. Well, that fits our model. I guess it could fit the globe too, right? It appears and it disappears. You know, it could fit either one. This description that we see in Psalm 19 doesn't fit modern cosmology. I hope you could at least agree with me on that, all right? The sun is going in a circuit around the earth, under the dome. It doesn't fit this flat earth model, what this psalm is saying. I mean, it doesn't fit the globe model. It fits the flat earth. It doesn't fit the globe. So, so I wonder, I guess, we, again, we have to make a decision. Do we believe what the Bible says or do we believe pseudoscience? Because it's not science, but it is pseudoscience. Which one do we... Well, you know, a lot of people will do, well, they don't want to say they disbelieve the Bible. So what they do is say, well, this is just the language of accommodation. And I've read a lot of people say this. God is explaining it how we see it. It's not how it really is. It's just how we see it. Let me ask you something. How many of you ever looked up in the sky and said, that's a solid dome up there? Anybody ever done that? I don't see it. Do you think the ancients looked up and said, man, that thing looks solid? How would they get that? How would they get that from looking up? I think that God does accommodate some things, some areas of his communication, because we have limits to what we can understand. But I don't think he's doing that here because it's plain, I think, what he's talking about. I don't think he uses language of accommodation for any subject that's within the realm that we can understand. We have the ability to understand these things, and it makes perfect sense when you get the model right. All right. I'm convinced from the Bible 
that the earth is a dome. I mean, the earth is flat with a dome over it. The earth, not the sun, is fixed in space. The heliocentric view pictures the sun as motionless at the center of the solar system with the earth revolving around it. So all these verses about the sun coming and going and in a circuit and all that, that just that doesn't fit with that view. And, you know, people say, well, language of accommodation, I mean, it does appear that way to us, but maybe it is that way, and that's why it appears that way, all right? But we have the high priests of pseudoscience. They've convinced people that the Bible is wrong and the earth is in motion. Now, man did not believe this until Copernicus came along and started, you know, telling us that, yes, you know, this is what it really is. Until the pseudoscience convinced people that the earth under the dome was primitive, foolish idea, contradicted by all kinds of evidence, practically all Bible scholars understood it to be flat with a dome over it. And the same way, the Bible scholars also upheld special creation until the pseudoscience convinced the world that there's a vast quantity of evidence proving evolution. I don't argue with evolutionists. I just tell them, you know your ancestors better than I do. They're monkeys, okay. Mine weren't. In both cases, though, people, here's what we have to get. This is so important to this subject. There is no evidence for these things. There's no science for these things. Science doesn't deal in these realms. It's imagination. And you try to, you know, ask them to prove these things, and boy, you'll get a lot of complicated jargon, but like your head will be spinning because just tell me how it happens. They can't do it. And I think pseudo-scientific theories are going to come and go, but the Word of God endures forever. So truth has to be found in the Scriptures. The Bible, people, has a monopoly on the truth. It's God's Word. It has to be believed not the imaginations of men. And I know if you come to this view and you hold this view now, then you're going to be laughed at, you're going to be ridiculed, you'll be mocked by the globe heads, and that's okay. They've always mocked the truth, all right? Yeah, you got flat heads and globe heads. You know, you get in one camp or the other, all right? The Bible teaches, I believe, and if you can show me differently, if I'm wrong about Rakia, if I'm wrong about somehow missing something here, please use Scripture. I'm open to Scripture correcting me. I'm not, again, I'm not open to different models or different pseudoscientist claims. I don't want to hear it. I don't care about it. I just care about what the Bible says. None of this people happened with the Big Bang. God created the world, and listen, He created it specifically for us. And that's the thing about heliocentricity. We're just a, a dot out there floating around this huge galaxy and all this universe, a bunch of other dots, and we're insignificant. We don't mean anything. When you realize, well, wait a minute, maybe all this other stuff's cartoons, and we're the only thing there is, and God created us, and He put us on this special plane, and He put a dome over us to protect us and keep us and keep us safe. You know what? You don't have to worry about global warming. You know why? There's no globe. <laughs> How can it be warm if there is none, all right? That's just a nonsense of men, again, trying to, you know, trying to get money from us because, you know, they can't even fix an election, but they're going to fix the environment, and all of a sudden it won't be warm. You know, it's just a bunch of nonsense, okay? And, you know, you don't need to worry about meteors hitting the earth and knocking us out of orbit and all this nonsense. None of that. It's all nonsense. People were not here by chance. We're God's creation. And such a special creation that He sent His Son to die for His elect. He, and because we're His very special creation, He created a very special environment for us. And when we understand this, I think it just should cause us to praise Him, to thank Him for His goodness. Revelation 4.11 says, Worthy are you, our Lord and God. To receive glory and honor and power. Why? For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. He created it all. He created it for us, His children. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for Your Word. I thank You for the opportunity to look into this. 
Lord, I know it contradicts so much of what we hear in our world today, but most of your word does do that. Help us, Lord, to cling to the truth of the Bible, to cling to inspiration, to seek to understand exactly what the Bible is saying. Lord, I understand we can, we can misunderstand, we can misapply text of Scripture. Lord, teach us. Help us to deal with your word accurately, faithfully, for your glory. Thank you, Lord, for your grace to us. Amen. And again, let me just emphasize, I'm coming from what I understand is a biblical perspective because I really don't have a dog in the fight. I don't, globe, flat, it doesn't really matter. It, it's not going to change my day tomorrow. I'm going to get up and I'm going to do the same things, okay? But again, I, I, to me, it just goes to inspiration. That's what's important. Questions, comments? What? I agree. That it's the inspiration of Scripture that's on trial in this debate. And, it, you know, if they can make the Bible wrong, and like we looked at last week, you know, I mean, Walton says, well, the Bible's wrong about that, so maybe it's wrong about this. And he threw out the idea of Satan and demons. He just throws it all out. And what else? David? I always thought that the stars and everything were in the firmament. Is that correct? Yes, I think they're embedded in it. So did I understand correctly last week that does the firmament move then? Because then that's then that's a good question. Okay, George this is that the it moves from east to west. This is this is an interesting. Question. I don't know that we can even answer this question. We can speculate, right. but if the stars are embedded, then the whole thing's moving, or are the stars moving within it? Right. And I don't know. What, right. We don't even know what stars are. Hmm. Okay? We look up there and we say, there's a light. That's all I can tell you for sure. There's lights in the heaven. That's all I can tell you. And someone else might know. It's a ball of gas. It's 90. It's further away than the sun. Those things are, the sun's 93 million miles away, they say, but those are way farther away. <laughs> well, not really, you know. <coughs> Is there anything on the other side? Is there anything on the other side that don't? Bible talks about waters above. I don't well, get that. I mean, as far as like other oh. stars or planets or anything. No, I don't think there's any other planets. I don't think there's anything. There's no universe. There's nothing outside our dome. That's it. We're, we're closed. We're in. There's nothing. This is our world. This is the world. That's all I understand. Okay. Right, yeah. I don't know anything anywhere. Right, I'm just trying to figure out what the premises are. So what are we're on planet? Um, the Falsters write, Joshua 10 13 says, The sun stood still and the moon stopped. Wouldn't that show it is sun moving if it can be stopped? Yes, exactly. Again, I, I agree 100%. The sun is what's moving. Okay, it's not, and there's a lot of controversy about that text, and you have to get into. You have to get into some deep stuff about the stars to understand because what that culture believed about war and the looking in the stars. So there's a lot more to it than the, just the sun, you know, stopping in that text. But that's, yes, the Bible indicates everywhere the sun moves. It indicates everywhere the earth does not, which is the exact opposite of what everyone is telling us. Okay, a bill says, we rightly criticize dispensationalists for interpreting as literal what we understand as symbolism. Yet now you appear to criticize people who do not hold to flat earth because we interpret Old Testament cosmology statements symbolically. Which is it? Oh, so I have to choose one or the other? So some things are metaphorical? That makes everything metaphorical? I mean, do we have to make those distinctions? We understand apocalyptic language. We don't take everything metaphorical. We understand there's some language that's that way. So God talking about his creation, we, we can't take that literally, though, right? Well, I do. And it, again, if you, got, you want to show me some text, Bill, that says that this is clearly not literal language, it's somehow metaphorical, I'm open to it. Oh, man. Sorry, I'm not, that's like a book. I don't have. <laughs> well, when it's that long, it'd take me a couple minutes to even read it. 
Someone says, I knew you were this based. Praise Yahweh, he created an enclosed system. Again, one of the reasons I taught on this to start with is I've been getting questions from people. People writing me, people, are you flat earth? And I'm like, how'd you know that? <laughs> well, you don't use the word globe, you talk about the plane, you talk, you know. So, yeah, people have picked up on it, okay? So I figured I better deal with it. Again, and someone will put in the comments on YouTube, welcome to, you know, well, I've been here for, and I've been here for eight years too. I just wasn't something I talked about, okay? Because uh, people think you're crazy when you talk about it. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah. A great learning here. Love that the sun does not rise. What a lie. You see that on the many breakfast commercials gr growing up. Even some today like Jimmy Dean sausage and biscuit commercials. <laughs> well, again, you know, whatever the conspiracy is behind this whole thing, it is in your face all the time. Every time you watch a movie, there's a globe there first. Why, why do they show you a globe every, when they're going you know, to watch a movie? You watch a TV show, there's a globe. I'm like, what are they trying to push here? You know? And it, here's a funny thing. You want, you want to have some fun? Go, picture, go get all the pictures of the globe you can find and compare them. You're like, whoa. Who did, they're, they're all different. And talk about cloud. Some of them, they take the computer and they make the cloud, and they just got the same cloud pattern spread all over. Same exact cloud. And then the next scene, you know, it's always clouds. There's, you don't see any satellites in those pictures. They say there's hundreds of thousands of satellites up there. None of them show up because there's no picture. No pictures. Nobody ever had a picture. Where is the Arctic in this orientation of Earth? The North Pole's in the center. The South Pole is the, around, it's the outside extreme edge Antarctica is an ice wall that surrounds the whole thing, all right? That's, that's the model, all right? That's as far as I understand it, okay? I've never been there, but I've seen plenty of pictures of it, all right? Um, but it, it, it's an enclosed system. You've got this couple hundred, uh, couple hundred foot high ice wall that keeps everything in. You know, nothing gets out of that. And then you have, you know, ice and snow for hundreds of miles, I think that uh, Admiral Byrd said he made 200 miles in, from what I understand, which is absolutely crazy to me. There's no way I would do that under any circumstance. I don't like freezing to death. No, thank you. Okay. And I don't know what he was looking for, but, and I don't know what he found. Gary? Um, where are the planets? Or are they just... What planets? planets? Yeah. Do they even exist? I don't think Jupiter, planets exist. Saturn, that I don't think that exists. So you don't believe in high-power telescopes? That can see yeah, I believe in high-power telescopes. And if you look at pictures of high-power telescopes, what you see is a blurry light-like. <laughs> and then they take that blurry light and they make this picture out of it. Look, it has rings around it. It's got holes in it. It's got, you know, and they just make that stuff up. There, I don't think there's anything outside the dome. As far as planets or any of that. The Bible talks about wandering stars. They call those planets. Jude talks about it. They say those are planets. They're moving. Mm -hmm. The Bible calls them wandering stars. But so you believe that the moon is inside the firmament? The Correct. Window, yes. But you don't believe we've been to the moon? I don't believe what? We've been to the moon. No. Why not? Why would I think we have been? Well, if it's in the dome, wouldn't it be easy to get to? <laughs> well, first of all, you'd have a hard time landing on a light. It's not a rock. It's a light. But by everything they said, we've been there. And I'm like, but the pictures, again, if you can look at that thing they said landed there, I just, it doesn't any look like it would fly. Okay, it doesn't, how it landed on there and then took off from there. I just think that's all part of trying to put in our heads that, there's stuff out there, and we've been there, and we know stuff, and you've got to listen to us. <laughs> okay, let's take a break, all right? Someone says, hey, Dave, this is off the subject. <laughs> I've always wondered why you never end your prayers with, in Jesus' name, we pray. Uh, Jesus doesn't mean much to me. Yeshua does, okay? But that's... That's a biblical misunderstanding that you have to tack that on the end of your prayers. You pray in His name, meaning His character. 
That's what name means in Scripture. Name has, is character. I pray according to who Yeshua is. I don't have to tack that on the end of every prayer. You know, it just, so many things the church does, and it's like, where's that in Scripture? We just create this thing, and then, again, we need to question things. Why? Okay? How? I was talking to one of my nieces yesterday, and she said that she's a physical therapist, and one of her clients was getting all over. He's a pastor, and he's getting all over because she has tattoos, and you're not allowed as a Christian to get tattoos. And I'm like, okay. And I said, next time, ask him, can you give me a scripture reference? Okay, he'll probably give you one from the Tanakh, because you can pull that from the Tanakh, but then you have to understand, Tanakh's talking, that's talking to Israel about what God's plan for Israel is. Tell him in the, but this guy told her, well, it's in the New Testament too. And I said, here's what you need to do. Just learn to start asking, where is that? Show me that reference. It'll shut people up so quickly. The Bible says, where? And that's the end of conversation. Because they don't know. So just learn to ask that question. Glory to God for the truth we find in His Word. Thank you so much for having the courage to preach the truth of flat earth. I'm learning so much. Jill in Costa Rica. Thank you, Jill. Uh, it's, it's encouraging. From Norm. It's not the dome they reject. It's the glorious one who sits in its top. Thank you so much for your pure analogy of faith. Thank you, Norm. I appreciate that. Um, thank you so much for coming out. <laughs> Coming out, I'm out of the closet. I'm, I'm, I'm out of the closet and under the dome, all right? Of flat earth, <laughs> coming out of the flat earth closet. Flat earth preterists are a rare find. Much love from Oregon. You know, they're really not because the, the group is no longer there, but I belong to a group on Facebook called Flat Earth Preterists. I guess maybe that's why I closed. There wasn't a lot of, <laughs> there wasn't a lot of uh, stuff going on there. Um. Junior asks, what about foundations of the earth underneath the dome, underneath the flat earth? I don't know. I don't know what's under there. The Bible talks about it being on foundations, about it being solid. I don't know. Because how would I? If the Bible doesn't talk about it, you know. How deep is the flat earth we're on? How far have they dug down? Anybody know? Eight Eight miles is the furthest they've ever gotten, okay? They didn't get to China, so... You know, <laughs> I, how deep, how thick is it? How deep is it? I don't know. I don't know. Now they're saying it, it's a core. It's a molten metal core. So much nonsense. You know, so much nonsense that they just make up. And how do we prove any of this stuff? Why do you suppose flat earth makes people so angry? The only reason I can think of is they feel embarrassed or stupid that they've been deceived for so long. I don't know, you know, or they can't believe that they've been deceived, so therefore they're angry, like, that can't be, because I, I don't believe, I believe this other way. Well, they've seen the pictures, they know. Yeah, well, true, if you've seen the pictures, then you know we have outer space and all this wonderful stuff out there, and little green men, and next time someone tells tell you about Martians, how'd they get in the dome? Okay, <laughs> they got the gatekeepers opening the window so they can get in, all right? Okay, I don't really understand this question. They're talking about, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. If Christians think the six-day narrative is disproved, I don't think that, why do they bother with the fourth commandment? The Sabbath memorizes Yahweh's work of creation. I, I don't really understand the question. Yahweh is our Sabbath rest. We rest in Him. It's the only commandment not brought into the New Testament because He is our Sabbath rest. But I do believe in the six-day creation. Hey, David. Hi, David. This is from Bonnie. She says, I watched a video called Correct Cosmology. Excellent. Documentation. Bless you for your courage. Thank you, Bonnie. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of good stuff out there on Flat Earth um, from a lot of different perspectives. It's hard to find. You won't find it on YouTube too easily. Go to Rumble. You have a lot better chance. We, Jeff put some links in the video 
and my notes from last week are up, and I have a couple links in the notes to a couple good videos that will help you if you want some more information on that. Someone asked, if the sun's within the dome, how does it ever get dark on the earth? There's a vanishing point. You can only see so far. Now, if I took a flashlight, and I took a place, and I had the flashlight over here, and I shined it here, you're not going to see it over here, and I move that flashlight around, when it gets over you, then it lights. And when it gets far away from you, it's darkness. We're on a, that's the thing, this place we're on is pretty big, okay? And the sun's moving around over top of it. Again, there's plenty of models out there that demonstrate this, that show how this works. What happens when there's a solar eclipse? I don't know. I don't know everything about this, okay? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not claiming to know everything about this. I'm telling you that I'm trying to stick what, what the Bible says, okay? That's, that's what's important to me, all right? Uh, Jordan, hey Jordan, Jordan Grant says, going to be a battle between covenant creation and us, basically. Yeah, well, you know, covenant creation says beyond creation science. There's no science in creation, so they lost to start with, okay? And, you know, and... and Vaughn, J.R. Vaughn, who wrote the, one of the authors of the book, he commented on last week's video, and only comment he had, all he had to say was, why do you show a picture with the sun rising in the west? Uh, what's wrong with that statement? How does a picture show the sun rising? Anybody know? That's, that's the whole comment he makes on an hour's worth. How does a, he shows a picture with the sun rising? I'm like, that's your argument? Okay, okay. Interesting note, I think you mentioned that the UN symbol is the flat earth. It is. The, flat, the UN symbol is a, a picture of, you know, the flat earth. Um, like I said, I think they stick it in our face to show, you're so dumb, you'll never get this, you know, like NASA with the forked tongue. Brandon from Oregon said, would have been quite a trick to move a shadow backwards. Yeah, I agree. But, you know, it's again, if you're talking about God. The fake photos of the moon show a surface of gray dust that doesn't look like anything that would be reflective at all. <laughs> again, the whole idea of reflective stuff. Pastor Dave, we can't get through the firmament. But did the fallen angels actually get from the other side? Wonderful, thank you. Yes, here's the thing. From that realm, the realm of heaven, the realm of God, angels pass, God's passed through, angels pass through, God comes and goes. It can, it's, where is heaven? I don't know that it's a location, it's a realm. But they don't have to worry about the dome, okay? They can, they can, they can get through that in the room. So, right, the locker room, and he just, here he was, you know, I mean, it's not that hard a thing. All right, so this is not, necess this is not necessary to be brought up during this session, but the Bible seems to indicate in several places that stars are angels, okay? Look up videos of people zooming in with the Nikon P90 cameras, very fascinating, would love to hear your thoughts on this. The Bible does refer to angels as stars. That doesn't mean there's no literal stars, okay? It talks about angels as stars, it does, but it also talks about literal stars. I don't know that every light in the heaven is an angel. The angels, when they show up, they're glowing light sometimes, okay? So I don't know. Again, there's very little we know for sure without making stuff up. Stan? Uh, two things. I read somewhere, I was doing a little bit of research on this, and somebody said, I think it was Google or somewhere, said, flat earthers deny the gospel of Christ. I went, eh, really? <laughs> Here's the thing. Have you ever heard of the Flat Earth Society? Yeah. That is a shill group set up to make flat earthers look stupid. Okay, and they do a lot of dumb things, you know, and so people will look at that, and they'll say, oh, but they're idiots, you know. Well, that's what it's made to do. Why so much work to make this seem like it's wrong, you know? What, what is behind this? Someone says, remember Mark Twain saying, it's easier to fool someone than convince someone they have been fooled. Yeah. Boy, I agree with that. I agree, and I think that's why the emotions get so riled up about this, you know. I've been wrong all this time. 
Again, the dome is solid, yet angels, spiritual beings, and our soul, in the last day we'll be able to go through it. Yeah, we can go through that. That's not, again, talking about a spirit being, this body's not going to be like, I'm not going to get stuck, I can't get through. No. Besides, it's got windows in it. <laughs> Hello from California. My fiance is currently in the Philippines. When a video call her last night over there, and it's daytime here, so if the earth is flat, how do you explain that? Again, the sun is local, it's close, and when it's over you, you have light. When it gets away, you have darkness. Nobody's questioning that. That's so simple. Okay, David? One guy left a comment saying um, he wanted us to set up a telescope here in Virginia Beach and tell him which direction we have to face it to see Mount Everest if the earth is, earth is flat. And I'm like, there's so many other thing variables. Right, I know. They go, it's, right, it's like, not, it's like if the earth's flat, you should be able to see a zillion miles away. Well, if you're so if you're, shooting, if you're looking at the one way, how are you going to see over the Appalachian Mountains? And you have atmospheric conditions, right. you know, that block you see. You know, sometimes you can't even see across the street. It depends on. There's a lot of factors. Those right. are silly. Again, are. those are silly arguments. And again, <laughs> let's argue from, you know, the scripture. Uh, someone said, thanks for having the courage to share the truth about the realm. You're the first pastor we've heard preach on this. We went to a Flat Earth conference in 2018 and heard Rob Skiba teach on this. Yes, Rob Skiba and I both came to this view at the same time, which was fascinating. I mean, I remember the very beginnings when Rob was putting stuff out about this, and I'm seeing the same thing, and I'm looking back and forth at his stuff. And it was So however long he's been in that, I've been in it too. Um, hi, trying to understand how can the earth be flat? Where would the water go or to the end of the earth? They used to think they would fall off the earth. Well, I've tried to explain that. You know, there's a 200 foot high ice wall that circles the whole earth. So nothing's pouring off the edge. Those pictures you see of ships falling off the edge, of, you know, and cats <laughs> knocking things off the flat earth, you know. <laughs> That's all just nonsense, okay, to make you think how stupid it is. It's an enclosed system, okay? And, and those ice, the ice wall keeps the water in. Here's the thing to me. If you know anything about water, it always seeks a level surface. Show me anything. Any, you show me anything where water bends. But magically, on a ball that's spinning at 1,000 miles an hour, it bends and sticks to it. I can take a ten wet tennis ball and spin it. You know what happens to that water? Ooh, well, that's because the There's ball doesn't have gravity. No gravity no okay, <laughs> but show me bendy water. You know, again, pour water anywhere. It goes level because that's what it does. It's level. It doesn't, you know, bend around things. When coming face to face with the depth of deception that this topic entails, we're forced to question everything else in life including one's theology. There are few that are willing to embrace this challenge. The truth must be proclaimed regardless, regardless of the offense it may induce. Yes, I think if we're really seekers of truth, we, you know, you're going to be offended, you're going to be upset. But when I said at the beginning of the video last week, they've lied to us about everything. I really mean that. I mean, they lie to us about medical stuff. They lie to us about history. The stuff we hear about history, I'll tell you what, it's so many things have been made up. Okay, Victor writes the history books, okay, and they write what they want and they tell us what they want us to know. So you just really have to question things, you know, and sometimes you don't have the ability to get answers for some of these things because we just don't know. Okay, I got a question from <laughs> some lady named Kaylin. If the moon is reflective, how did people land on the moon without going blind? <laughs> how are there pictures of the moon without it just being white light? Yes, and, and how, are the, how is the sky behind the moon shots, behind the pictures, it's black. There's no stars anywhere. David? I was told that on one of the comments. Oh, yeah? Yes, because the sun is shining. They said, so when you go out in the daytime, you see stars? So that's why you can't see stars from the moon. Okay, because, <laughs> wow, I don't know if I can even process that. Okay. Because, so they're saying you can't... Because sunlight is blocking out 
Okay. Or the the sunlight blocks there. out the stars on the black background. Yes. So you can't see them. Right. Okay. Yeah, okay. The moonlight is, is blinding the stars out. Of them. All right. Whatever. <laughs> okay. You know. Again. That comment was on there. <laughs> your, your camera's not high quality. You have to take a boat light for it. Yeah. Yes. We don't. The, the thing is, people, and you know, people, they go, well, I see this or I saw that. You know, someone wrote me and they go, well, I was on a ship and, and they had the railing around it. And I looked through the railing and I could tell there was a curve. Really? You don't understand that your eyes, you know, show you different things. And so you're going to say, I don't believe the Bible because I saw the curve. Did you really see the curve? Did, can you, if, if there's a curve, why can't we measure it? How come no matter what measurements we take, it never shows up? It just doesn't. And we use NASA's math, and boom, there's no... How do we see Chicago across Lake Michigan? How do we do it? Flat Earth means it's a square plane. Mm -hmm. That there's no ups and downs and valleys and hills yeah. and mountains and all that stuff. Right. Yeah, because you can go in a local area here mm -hmm. and see a quote-unquote horizon <laughs> because just a natural yeah. ebb and flow of the Earth. So that doesn't necessarily mean it's brown. Yeah, the ground, our ground, you know, that's why when you do this test, you do it over water because if you do it over land, you got hills and you got mountains and you got obstacles and you really can't do it. But over water, it's always flat. So you can do this on water. And again, it's simple. You, any, any of you can do it. Get a laser, get a, something high powered that you can see and go out over a couple miles of water, shoot across a lake or something. And you'll see this, that there's, there's just no curve. Jordan says they claim to use sextons to the stars in space in order to make their way to the moon. He says, LOL. <laughs> yeah, again, a lot of the stuff they tell us people is just, it's sadly not true. Okay, bo bottom line is, and um, Yeshua is our Savior. He's Lord of all. Whatever, whatever planet, whatever thing we're on, it doesn't change our view of the gospel it doesn't change our view of who Christ is, who God is. I just think that the Bible teaches this, so that's why I'm teaching it. Now, there, I think more and more people are aware now that we're on a flat earth, and people are arguing, and they're trying to make fools of them and trying to put them down. But again, just use your senses, you know? I mean, just think about things. You really on a thousand mile an hour ball spinning around like that? I, I never felt it. It's kind of funny, because when I... Uh, if I go 100 miles an hour in a car, it's, it seems like I'm really going fast. But 1,000 miles an hour, that would really be fast, okay? And then you got all these issues, the ball's spinning, and you got all these flight issues. So if I'm going one way, I should get there really quick. If I go on the other way, it should take me forever, because the globe's spinning against me, right? I... Yeah, I know. It's just, the arg again, the arguments all come from the globe, or, you know... At least, at least Bill's arguing, trying to argue from Scripture and say, well, it's, you know, it's metaphorical, which to me was a silly argument, Bill, because, yeah, there's metaphorical language, there's literal language. Yes, anybody would admit that. Any preterist admits that, okay? But don't say everything's figurative. You look at the language, you determine what kind of language is this, okay? All right, let's close. Come on up here and are we going to sing? You don't know? No? We're too tired? All right. That's fine. It is kind of late. How did it get to be that late? Let's close in prayer. Thanks for being here. Those online, thanks for coming back. It's amazing. After last week, anybody came back. <laughs> Appreciate you all. And again, I'm, I'm very open to any biblical arguments. Huh? Yeah, I did. May I trick you? <laughs> no. Next week, Lord willing. <laughs> Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love for us, Lord. Th thank you for the freedom that we have to discuss the Scripture, Lord. That is such, such a blessed privilege. We can disagree. We can go back and forth, but we have the ability to discuss it openly and freely. Thank you, Lord, for that freedom that we enjoy here. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray we would, Father, compare everything by the word of God. Lord, I thank you for your grace to us. I thank you for sending your son to pay our sin debt and bring us into your family. Thank you, Lord. Amen. All right, folks, have a great week. Those watching us live, thanks for being here. Appreciate you all being with us today. Next week, Thessalonians, Lord willing.